The person that I had the greatest offense toward was my brother. I had guilt for what I had done, and all my life I had just tended to kind of blame him. But he had the same thing. He had guilt for what he did and blame for me for what I did. And so that's why you want to bury the hatchet. You just want to forget about it. But it doesn't resolve it. But God has convicted me of how wrong I was. That was wrong in his eyes. Will you forgive me? When we have disputes with others, thereafter, do we typically focus on everything they did wrong? And if anyone confronts us about misconduct, do we quickly highlight the faults of the other party? Anytime our guilt is exposed, it's easy for us to pull out a figurative weighing scale in our mind and try to alleviate that guilt by balancing it with blame. You don't realize what that person did, we might argue. I only responded spitefully because they brought it out of me. It's their fault for starting it. Mustering all our mental strength to avoid condemnation, we can keep a list of all the wrongs the other person did. And these listed wrongs may even be true, legitimate violations of how a person should conduct themselves. However, let's fast forward to the end of our life, to the moment where we stand before the Lord and begin to give an account for everything we ever did. When our past contentions with others are brought up, what is God going to say? Will He declare, you did wrong toward them, but they also did wrong toward you, so we'll just call it even? Or will He say, I understand you wronged them only because they wronged you first, so the guilt is on them. We may think our escape is to point the finger at others' misdeeds, but how does God respond to our finger pointing? In Genesis chapter 3, it shows us exactly how God responds. After Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, God confronts them about it, starting with Adam. But what does Adam do? He goes to the weighing scales to alleviate his guilt with blame, saying, The woman gave it to me. When God confronts the woman, she too goes to the scales to alleviate her guilt with blame. The serpent beguiled me. God then pronounces a judgment on the serpent for inspiring these acts of sin. But the judgment didn't stop with, quote, the one who started it. Every participant in that sinful situation received a consequence for their part in it. This is how God deals with acts of wrong. And when we reach the end of our life, God will deal with us in the same way if our wrongs were never amended. So, when we are at odds with someone else, we would do well to ask ourselves the question, what is God going to hold me accountable for in this situation? If we lay aside our list of accusations towards others and consider only what we did, will we be guilty or not guilty? Granted, when others inflict physical damage upon us or violate the law in some other way, this is not something to be overlooked. Such actions ought to be reported to the appropriate authorities. However, what we are talking about here is not matters of abuse or life-threatening situations but the deeds God defines as sin that we chose to participate in. These are not situations of us being victimized by someone else, but rather times when we think of, talk about, or do something to others in a manner that God's word tells us not to. In these instances, when we realize we did something wrong, God calls us to take responsibility for our actions. The Apostle Paul said, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. The person that I had felt the uh, greatest offense toward was my brother. And um, so I'll never forget, I, I was so grateful for the instruction on what to do, you know, how to go about it. I went to him and made the appeal and asked him to forget. I worked out the wording, you know, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? He just looked at me and said, well, Don, um, we all do those things growing up. Let's just bury the hatchet. I said, you know, I appreciate so much your willingness to clear this up. And this was key. I said, but God has convicted me of how wrong I was. And, uh, I, and I appreciate that, but that was wrong in his eyes. Will you forgive me? 
and there was this long silence. And again, I'm so thankful that I was encouraged, don't say anything. I just waited and uh, finally he said, yes, I forgive you. And the very next words out of his mouth totally shocked me. He said, uh, will you forgive me too? So many of these cause and effect sequences that there are in nature exist in the personal world. And uh, this one here was the, the issue with guilt and blame. And it turns out, you know, I had guilt for what I had done. And all my life, I had just tended to kind of blame him. But he had the same thing. He had guilt for what he did and blame for me for what I did. And so that's why you want to bury the hatchet. You just want to forget about it. But it doesn't resolve it. And when he said it, I forgive you, and I said it, there's a, uh, there is nothing that can explain this other than the spiritual world that between us, it was like there was a washing away of everything that ever happened between us. It was just gone. And it's just been beautiful ever since. God had major work to do in my life and a beautiful work of healing and restoring so many different ways.